Thank you very much, uh, and thank you, Avnis uh, Society of Internal Medicine, for inviting me. The reason I chose this talk is that uh, uh, lots of patients, they present to our internal medicine colleagues or general physicians with joint pains. So this is just how to approach patients with multiple joint pains. So objectives of my talk are important points in the history taking. Uh, what are the clues in the physical examination of such patients? How to interpret the investigations? And just a brief introduction to the treatment. So uh, coming to the history, evaluation of a polyarticular pain, it begins with potentially ruling out musculoskeletal emergencies. So the emergencies are uh, septic arthritis, so usually monoarticular, but it can be polyarticular. The patients usually have uh, constitutional symptoms such as fever, fatigue, and uh, weight loss. Um, they can have, uh, if the patient has more than expected physical findings and more joint pain than what you see on the, on the physical examination, the patient may have a compartment syndrome. Or in case of burning pain, numbness, or paresthesia, it may suggest radiculopathy or neuropathy. So pain, pain is very important and how to take a history of pain. So the different things are quality, time of onset, exacerbating or remitting factors, and duration of pain. Um, burning pain usually suggests a neurological cause. The inflammatory arthritis pain uh, tends to worse with immobility. For example, patients usually have morning stiffness one hour or more, usually in rheumatoid arthritis and polymyalgia. Whereas the pain of osteoarthritis, it is usually aggravated by motion and it is relieved by rest. And the other thing is the symmetry, symmetry, whether in RA patients, the patient, the joint pains are usually symmetrical, whereas in osteoarthritis, bursitis, or tendinitis, they are asymmetrical. Duration of symptoms, so if the patient has a joint swelling or a synovitis for less than six weeks, it could, could represent a viral infection. However, it is for longer duration, then it's usually suggested rheumatic disease. Uh, and the patients who have longer symptoms, they are uh, not going to have acute gout or a bacterial arthritis because that is usually an acute presentation, whereas they can have a chronic gout or a rheumatic disease or spondyloarthritis. Then in the history taking, it's important to assess their functional capacity, also take history of joint injury, risk, of, risk factors for history of infection, medications and travel history. Then associated symptoms. So weakness usually suggests a neurological or a myopathic disorder, whereas the other symptoms such as fatigue, rash, adenopathy, alopecia, ulcers, chest pains, Raynaud phenomena, they usually suggest a systemic rheumatic disease. Uh, fever, night sweats, weight loss may also suggest a systemic illness. Always ask about psoriasis, uveitis, and previous inflammatory bowel disease or symptoms of inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, and always check about history of back pain and stiffness because patients may, may present to you with a knee swelling, but they may have underlying spondyloarthritis. So high grade fever usually suggests infection, but a low grade elevation in body temperature can be seen in crystal induced arthritis as well as many rheumatic diseases. Um, gastrointestinal and uh, gast uh, genitourinary symptoms or recent sexual exposure suggest possibility of infectious portal of entry and that may give rise to you the suspicion of reactive arthritis or um, patients may have underlying inflammatory bowel disease. So fever suggests maybe infectious arthritis, post-infectious or reactive arthritis, systemic rheumatic diseases such as lupus, crystal-induced arthritis, and other diseases such as uh, cancer, sarcoidosis. Then coming to the examination. So examination is divided into two parts. One is the joint examination, and other is the general examination. So what do we look for in joint examination in, uh, when we suspect a patient with inflammatory polyarthritis? So the first thing is to establish the presence or absence of synovitis. So which it basically means joint swelling. And there may be a warmth over the joint, the joint may be visibly swollen, there may be a joint line tenderness, effusion, and loss of motion. Um, reduced range of active motion with preserved passive range of motion, they usually suggest a soft tissue disorder such as bursitis, tendinitis, or muscle injury. 
However, if both active and passive range of movements are reduced, then it usually suggests a joint disorder or a contracture. So, uh, bony enlargement or crepitus, that is other part of the joint examination. This is usually seen in, uh, in the osteoarthritis, uh, whereas acute pain with inability to weight bear or associated with soft tissue swelling and other signs of inflammation, which is extending far above or below the joint line, that can be a septic arthritis, a crystal-induced arthritis, and the third differentiate can be fracture. So you can see here the two different pictures, the one on the right side of you, I mean, you can see there is an obvious swelling of the um, proximal interphalangeal joints. Whereas the picture on the left side of the screen, it may appear normal to most of the uh, physicians, but in this picture, there is an obvious swelling of both the wrists, the proximal interphalangeal joints, and the metacarpophalangeal joints. Now this is the picture, um, uh, you can see a bony swelling. So this is osteoarthritis. So um, these are the Hibberdon and the Bouchard nodes, the, which uh, represent osteoarthritis, uh, especially in the old age. So then coming to the general examination, um, look for any lymphadenopathy, parotid enlargement, oral ulcerations, heart murmurs, pericardial purification rubs, or uh, respiratory examination for any crackles. Um, so this is the presence of subcutaneous nodules. Um, you can see here the picture on the right side is actually a gouty tophi, whereas picture on the left side with two hands that these are the rheumatoid nodules. And the differentiating feature obviously is on the right side, you can see that there is a yellow color. Um, and you can see the crystals um, of the um, monosodium urate. Um, skin lesions, they can be seen, uh, they can suggest inf underlying infective endocarditis or they can be psoriasis, lupus, viral infections, Stills disease, dermatomyositis and vasculitis. So this is the, these are the skin lesions which you can see in the vasculitis um, on the legs and in the nail folds. Uh, so these are the um, uh, dermatological features in lupus. So you can see Raynaud's phenomena, butterfly rash, and obviously the, uh, the discoid rash um, of lupus. So these are the uh, clinical presentations in dermatomyositis. You can see the heliotropic rash around the eyes, and, um, and you can see here the, the, the gotron papules, uh, which are usually suggestive of um, dermatomyositis. So psoriasis, very important to look for, especially in the hidden parts. So it can be a scalp psoriasis, it can be an elbow or a knee joint, or it can be um, at the, uh, on the under tummy. So always ask for it and look for the hidden psoriasis. So this is the, the rash, the salmon pink rash, which is usually seen in people with Stills disease. Then eye problems. So some of these people may have a history of eye problems. So they may come to you with the joint pain, but always ask them about eye problem or they, if they have an eye issue, for example, a red eye, so look into it. So the different eye uh, presentations are keratoconjunctivitis, uveitis, uh, scleritis, and episcleritis. So here you can see the different pictures, um, the dry mouth, dry eyes, which is keratoconjunctivitis. Uh, so this is the, uh, for the scleritis and episcleritis. Uh, and then um, in the examination, do the spinal examination to look for spinal tenderness and deformities, and always, um, Keep in mind fibromyalgia and patients who have generalized pain with no obvious physical findings. So investigations, um, the general investigations are the routine test for the uh, CBC kidney liver function test, ESR, CRP. They are non-specific markers of inflammation, but they are also raised in other conditions such as infections, malignancy. So antibody tests, um, these are the antibodies to identify different pathogens such as group A, streptococcus, virus, parvovirus, hepatitis B, C, Borrelia, and Brucella, etc. So um, then coming to the specific the antibody test for the autoimmune diseases, so ANA, uh, it is commonly requested. It has a high sensitivity, but a low specificity for lupus. In negative ANA in a patient, patient with polyarthritis essentially rules out the diagnosis of SLE. 
A positive ANA may occur in many rheumatic diseases and non-rheumatic illness, and it can be a normal finding as well in a healthy individual. So patients with no clinical features of SLE is unlikely to have a disease, even in the presence of a positive ANA. The higher the titer of the ANA, the more likely that the patient has a lupus or another ANA-associated disease. If you suspect the patient has an underlying connective tissue disease, then you can request the additional tests such as double-stranded DNA, ENA, which is extractable nuclear antigen. So rheumatoid factor, this is another commonly done test. Uh, it is done when rheumatoid is suspected, but it has a limited diagnostic value. As you can see, in 50% of the patients with, with rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatoid factor may be negative initially. And approximately one third of the patients with rheumatoid arthritis, they remain seronegative throughout their course. And it can be positive in other inflammatory or infectious diseases such as lupus, and infective endocarditis, vasculitis, viral infections, they may all have a positive rheumatoid factor. And a high rheumatoid factor titers have a predictive value for a diagnosis of RA and may also predict poor outcome. So NTCCP antibody, which is anticyclic citrullinated peptide, it is more specific than rheumatoid factor for diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis and may predict an erosive disease and it has a very high specificity of 94.5%. So uric acid, it is elevated um, in gout. It may be normal in the acute attack. There are also asymptomatic hyperuricemia, which has a high prevalence in the general population. And so just finding of hyperuricemia on, on its own is not of a diagnostic value. And as I said, normal uric acid levels are fairly common in an acute attack of gout and uric acid level below the limit of normal uh, reference range would make the diagnosis of gout mess much less likely. Then there are other tests such as HLA B27, Brucella, Lyme serologies, which can be ordered depending upon the clinical suspicion. So the take home message is about the blood test is normal ESR CRP does not rule out inflammatory arthritis. A negative rheumatoid factor does not rule out rheumatoid arthritis. A positive ANA does not mean that it's lupus, and a raised uric acid does not always mean it's gout. So always interpret blood results in context of a clinical picture. So synovial fluid analysis can be performed if the diagnosis is not clear or if you're suspecting the uh, septic arthritis. So here is how we interpret the synovial fluid. Um, and classify them into inflammatory, non-inflammatory, and the septic. Uh, and also, if there are crystals present, then we can make the diagnosis of gout. So imaging, it is um, seldom necessary, but the highest yields is with the hands and the knee x-rays. Um, they are also helpful in the gout and CPPD disease. And sacroiliitis on the imaging in ankylosing spondylitis is helpful. However, in the early disease, it may be uh, normal. So MRI is um, more sensitive than X-ray for detecting sacroiliitis. So these are some of the imaging. The, the, the first, these, this, this is just showing the osteoarthritis. You can see the joint space narrowing in the interphalangeal joints and in the knees. So this is also osteoarthritis. Uh, these are the images of also osteoarthritis of the hip and the knee joint. So this is the imaging in the rheumatoid arthritis where you can see the periarticular erosions marked by the arrows. Um, so this is imaging of the gout. So these are, these are typically punched out lesions. They are juxta articular and uh, they are very uh, representative of gout. Uh, ultrasound can also be done if the, the diagnosis clinically you cannot uh, assess whether the patient has a synovitis or not, then uh, ultrasound can be requested and it's very useful in detecting subclinical synovitis. Uh, other things such as bone scan, they are rarely used and biopsy is rarely used, especially if you have diagnosis uh, suspecting tuberculosis, fungal infection or sarcoidosis. Um, so monoarthritis, uh, usually uh, the causes of monoarthritis are trauma, infection, crystals, osteoarthritis, systemic rheumatic diseases, uh, and any poly polyarticular arthritis can present as monoarthritis. 
So this is the treatment overview. Since you are the co-chair, we'll allow yes. you another one minute. <laughs> yes. So I have got just two slides left. So treatment overview for the rheumatic diseases. So we have non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Then we have steroids, which can be oral, intramuscular, intraarticular, and intravenous. Then we have the disease-modifying drugs, so which are divided into conventional disease-modifying drugs, so which are methotrexate, azathioprine, sulfasalazine, leflunamide. Then we have biological disease-modifying drugs. So there are different classes, which are NTTNFs, IL-17 inhibitors, IL-6 inhibitors, B-cell targeted therapies, T-cell targeted therapies, IL-23 inhibitors, and IL-1223 inhibitors. And then we have targeted synthetic disease-modifying drugs, and we have three of them, which is tofacitinib, baricitinib, opidacitinib, and recently, figlotinib is also approved. Thank you very much. <laughs>